Spence Lewis here for InsideTrackNews.com. I'm here hanging out. Look at that. That's a good looking race car. Just been vinyled with the Six Nations sensation Alex Hill, <laughs> who's told me all about her, her insane schedule. And I say insane in the, in the most positive way. 80 plus races in 2016. I mean, you guys are, are getting ready to head out onto the road, what, this weekend? Like, you're getting ready to go. Yep. Right? My two crew guys are leaving on Monday to go to Oklahoma. I, I mean, you, your, your progression through sprint car racing, through, through short track racing in general, has been pretty incredible. And I think most people in Ontario have heard a little bit about it, but I figure before you get too popular and before you're out on the road <laughs> so much that I can't catch you, I should probably sit down with you and, uh, and do a little digging here and find out a little bit about you. You're only 16 years old, but it feels like you've been around a lot longer because you've raced so much. How, how many races have you had since you started at Tilsonburg, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah. So if you, since you started at Tilsonburg, ballpark it for me. How many races have you had up until now? Uh, probably well into the hundreds, uh, right? Maybe 200? Maybe? 200 races. Because I used to race every Tuesday there. So 200 races for like, by the time you're 16. For like three years I raced every Tuesday of the summer. Maybe less than 200, I don't know actually. <laughs> I mean 200 sounds about right because you had what, 60 last year? Yeah. Over 60 just, just last year. So yeah. 200 is probably, probably a safe gauge. That's pretty incredible. Now you come from a sporting family, so competition it, it's it's no different. I mean, want to be the best at racing and want to be the best at hockey. There's some definite uh, uh, comparables there. Now, your dad played hockey. Your brother played hockey. I'm sure there's more people in your family, right? That are, yep. Okay, so where does your affinity and your love and your obsession with <laughs> racing come from? I mean, how, how, when did that start? Um, my dad is friends with Glenn Steyers, and Glenn Steyers owns the Shrieking Speedway, and then he got my dad into racing, Then my dad got Ryan Hunsinger to drive his sprint car in like 2008 maybe and then I start going to the track watching him in the grandstand and then I think early 2009 I asked my dad if I could drive and then he got me a QRC car and then went on from there. So you start going in 2008. Do my math for me. How old would you have been in 2008? Eight turning nine. Wow. So this is really, this is all you've ever really known and this is all you've ever really wanted to do. So a QRC cart, which is, is that like an outlaw cart? Yep. Okay. So at, at Tilsonburg, I hear the, I hear the name Tilsonburg a lot when I'm talking to, to drivers in your age bracket. A lot of people credit it with having a, a really good sort of development style divisions there. Uh, what, what was that like in your early, your early racing career? I mean, did you, did you learn a ton at Tilsonburg? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I learned a lot. I, um, yeah. <laughs> Now, from what I understand, you, you started in one of the lower divisions, and they, they insisted on moving you up. Is that how that sort of worked out? Well, I started in the beginners, um, whatever, and then I, then I think either by the end of the year or the next year after, I moved up to, um, not seniors, but juniors. And then as the years progressed, I went and just, the highest I got was seniors, but yeah. Now, when you're racing an outlaw cart, uh, you're, you're learning all about, throttle control, I'm assuming, right? Because the power to weight ratio, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible in one of those small carts. Yeah, the only difference was it wasn't like the kind that like Rico Abreu or Carl Larson races. It's a lot slower and it was indoor. So but I didn't really learn a lot of throttle control there, really. But um, I kind of like flat footed it a lot. <laughs> Now, this is before Oshweekin had the smaller... Do they run the same style carts at Oshweekin yep. on Thursday nights? Yep. So that would have helped a lot if that had track had been built yeah, a couple years yeah. earlier, right? Yeah. I think that track got built... or Well, it was there for the um, warm-up cars, for sprint cars. Mm -hmm. But they start doing QRC carts there the year I got out of it. <laughs> now, are you racing now, or have you raced against any of the drivers you were in a QRC cart with? Um, Dylan Westbrook. Okay. And... I never raced against Holly Porter in a QRC, but I raced like at the same place. And then now I'm racing with her, or I raced with her last year in Crate. So it's so funny that you used to race with Dylan Westbrook because he's sort of he's he's the other side of the coin. With it. when you look at blue chip prospects coming up through Ontario sprint car racing, the two names that you hear the most often are Alex Hill and Dylan Westbrook. And it's it's funny that you guys have been racing together this long. So you started racing against him when you were when you were nine years old, um, or it was later in life. Maybe around 2010, 11. Okay. Yeah. So you were 11, 12? I used, I used to race with his cousin, Hannah Farrell, a lot. And that's, I'm pretty sure that's how I got to know him. 
Now, when you were racing the QRC carts, what, was it always the understanding between you and your dad that you would be moving up to, to a full-size sprint car, or was it just sort of you, you wanted to try it to see if you liked it? Mm, kind of just, kind of both, I guess. I, I really like moving up, because ever since I was nine, I wanted to drive, or want to race in the World of Outlaws. So, like, that's been my goal, so... And this has sort of been where you've, where you've spent your life's energy, right? I mean, you, you were never really into organized sports at an at a, at a uh, elite level. It's always just been nope. racing. This is all you've wanted to do? No, I used to play baseball and hockey. Well, there you go. See, I did not know that. See, we're yeah. learning things here. <laughs> so how, so is that, was that before racing, or were you able to balance racing with the hockey and baseball? Uh, I've been playing, I was playing baseball ever since I was little, like t-ball. And then I played for Brantford Bobcats. And then the year after that, I just played like house league or whatever in at six in Six Nations. And then I got hit in the face with the ball, and then I kind of stopped. <laughs> now getting hit in the face yeah. with a baseball or flipping a sprint car. I'm assuming flipping a sprint car has has fewer. Uh, it gives you fewer physical injuries, injuries right? Yeah. Okay, so that makes sense. But makes sense why you would want to. Oh, oh but, yeah, I'm yeah. assuming a little a little bit more, right? <laughs> we're we're not talking yeah. the same income bracket. <laughs> So now, I mean, you're going out on the road this year. Last year, you were on the road for 60-plus dates. This year, it'll be 80-plus dates. I'm assuming when you're on the road that much, you, you don't really have time for any other sports, right? This is, this is pretty much it now? Yeah, just racing, racing in school. You mentioned that you, you're able to keep up on your studies. Now, unlike a lot of kids, kids is a relative, you're still a kid. I'm an old man, so you're a kid. <laughs> I mean, a lot of kids that you see go out on the road, uh, pavement super late model drivers would be the best comparable uh, they get tutors, or they mm -hmm. find a way to sort of get homeschooled. You are still in traditional high school, just like any other kid. How are you going to juggle that? Because you're you're a long way from summer vacation now, and you guys are getting ready for your first, you know, long road trip of the season. How's that going to play out for you? Uh, usually, we don't leave till the day of a race. Like if I race, like next week, I'll be racing on a Friday and Saturday, and I probably won't leave till the Friday. But um, usually I just tell my teachers like five five days beforehand, and then they give me like homework, or they got an online website where I can do homework. Then I just take notes, and then yeah. And up until now, it's it's never been a problem, sort of getting the grades to to keep this whole to keep this train rolling for you. Um, back in like grade nine and eight and ten, I never really knew what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do racing, and then since like early. No, late 2000, or grade 10, I wanted to um, pursue in social work. So that's like my main, or one of my goals is to go to university for social work. And that, and so I have to keep up on my school work for that. And then now, I used to be in all um, college level, applied level, and now, now I'm in mixed and apply, or academic and um, university level classes. So it's all, I mean, it's, this is not easy work, no. is what you're saying. No. A lot of essays, a <laughs> yeah. lot, of, lot of tests, right? Yeah. Okay, I mean, I remember grade 11. Grade 11 is sort of university selection. You're trying to figure out mm -hmm. what you want to do with your life, where you want to go. You were telling me off camera, you've already got a, a list of schools selected, and they're, they're pretty elite-level yeah. schools. You must have some pretty good grades if you want to go to some of these schools. Um, I don't, mm, my English grade wasn't that good last year or last semester, but ho hopefully it gets better next year. And uh, me and my mom were actually thinking about me repeating grade 11 English to get my markup higher, but yeah. There's nothing wrong with the victory lap. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that in the, in the big scheme, in the big picture. So, so you want to be a social worker, you want to go to university at, a, at an elite level school. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you mentioned some of the places, some schools out in, in California yeah. and <laughs> a couple schools in what, New York, right? Yep. So, but you also want to run eventually on the world of outlaws. So you want it all. You want to do it all. <laughs> Is it going to be possible years from now, two, three years? I mean, who knows if you try 410 this year and it turns out really well? I mean, who knows where you could end up? Yeah. Can you balance a career with running on the outlaws? Mm. Well, I'm in school. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> because <laughs> I know someone who I used to race with in um, my 600 micro sprint, and she was in university, and then I knew she ended up, she end up um, stop racing because of the school. It's demanding, yeah. right? I mean, it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of strain on you. It's a lot of time that you need to sort of invest. 
But when you look at your development and how far you've come in such a short amount of time, is it going to be difficult if the day comes where, you know, maybe one part of your brain is telling you to step out of the seat and focus on your, your career and your schooling and the other side is telling you to keep going? I mean, is that going to be, is that going to be a tough decision to make? Yeah, it will be. It'll be one of the toughest decisions of my life, probably. you got a couple of years before you got to worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Don't worry about it now. That's Two years. Yeah, that's a tomorrow problem. Forget it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> tell me a little bit about, okay, so tell me about the first time you practiced a crate sprint car. Because that's a pretty cool story, right? You had, Rand, was it Randy Hannigan was there with you? Your first time practicing? I don't even really remember it until my dad was just telling Your us. Your dad loves that story. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you just, what, so you're, you're at a test session with a couple of the of the, the Hills guys. Mm -hmm. They're practicing, they're shaking some cars down, and you just figure, hey, I, I want to jump in a crate sprint car, what the hell? Yeah, I, th yeah, I think that's how it went. I'm, I, don't, I don't really remember. I just remember Jamie being there with me and his wife, and then I remember me getting in the crate and then really enjoying it and then making, yeah. How big of an influence was Jamie Collard on you in your in your early career when you when you're sort of making the move over from from the QRC carts to to a crate sprint car? How 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 big of an influence was he? Uh, he was kind of a big influence. I don't, I don't really know if I really had a big influence because I knew I just wanted to step up into a sprint car, and like that was I was determined to do it. So I don't really know if like anyone or if I had like an influence to do it, but. I mean, when you look at the drivers you've been around from, from Hannigan to Sam Haferteep to Jamie Collard, Ryan Hunsinger, Shane Stewart, I mean, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's pretty incredible. Young drivers that are still cutting their teeth and, and finding their driving style would give their arm to be exposed to one of these drivers. You've had four, five, <laughs> six of them. It, it's pretty incredible. Have all of them kind of helped in their own way to kind of shape your driving style and, and help you sort of get through some of the learning curves of figuring out these cars? Yeah, I don't, when I was at the Chili Bowl this year, I, um, my steering was like kind of far away and like me or Daryl or no one from Parker Price Miller's team really like noticed. And then um, when I was racing, I came off the track and then Shane Stewart came over to Daryl and me and said, um, said we should probably put my steering wheel closer to me because it looked like I was like going like this too much. <laughs> and then I, I don't even know how he realized it because I didn't realize it. And then we changed that and it felt a lot better. So it helps have that, that yeah. fresh set of eyes, that yeah. extra pair of eyes on you. So Shane Stewart, of course, is now, he's out on the road with the Outlaws. Do you still get to see him fairly often? I mean, are, is, is he going to come down to your races this, this summer? Mm, maybe if I ever race with the World of Outlaws or go to a World of Outlaw race. And that's definitely the goal, right? Yeah. <laughs> Now, Daryl Turford is, he's such a genius, yeah. and he's revered, <laughs> revered in sprint car circles, not just in Ontario, but all across North America as, as being one of the brilliant young minds of the sport. What's it like working with him? I mean, what's it like having him who's, who's got your back at the racetrack every time that the trailer door comes down? Daryl's, Daryl's an awesome guy. There's no one else I would rather have crewing with me. Him and Ronnie are the best crew guys ever, and just working with them and them being around and it's just out of racing too it's fun they're funny they're they're great guys they're just they're like my two older brothers now he's he's your crew chief on paper right that's his mm -hmm. role has he also helped a little bit as a as a driver coach when it's just you and him at the speedway mm -hmm. yeah he all if i i get nervous if i don't ask him where i should go or how how much throttle control i should use or anything like that I, or where my even where my wing should be in the start i always get nervous and start panicking if he doesn't like Give me some tips. How difficult is it for you still to be able to, to read a track, to know what the surface is going to do, how the track's going to change? I mean, have you, have you sort of been able to, to pick that up in your, in your couple of years of, of racing a full-size sprint car? Mm, kind of, not really. I'm, this year, I'm just starting to get the down pack on the wing on whether or not to move it forward or backwards to get it tight or loose. And then I'm just starting to get the hang of that because last year I used to have tape on top of it where it showed light or tight or loose so is the tape off of it now yeah <laughs> that's off. like your training wheels right <laughs> took it off. training wheels are gone <laughs> you're on your own now <laughs> yeah now tell me a little bit about 2016 or 2015 pardon me because you went out on the road really for the first time mm -hmm. i mean you, you sort of you were you were out Oshawa weekend every friday but saturday you were everywhere right i mean you, you did shows all over the place primarily in ohio 
And I know the Ohio 305 scene is really, really good right now. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that because you're, you're racing with guys with 410 prowess, like guys that were really good 360 racers and, and moved down. So what was it like taking your limited experience and running up against these guys that have been doing it, you know, for, for years and years? It was, I remember my first race, I was really, really, really scared. Really nervous to see, like, how the fans and how everyone else would think of me. Because I know my first race there, it was 305 race in the ASCS, or no, All Stars were there. And, like, Tony Stewart, Craig Kinzer, they were all there. And I was, like, freaking out. And wouldn't, even if they didn't watch, I was still freaking out because I didn't. Was know. that at Attica? Where was your first 305 Attica. race? Attica? Yep. What's, what's the weekly scene there like? It's tough. Like, <laughs> It took me a while to get the hang of it. it took me a m more to get hang of it at Fremont. That was a tough track. For some of the drivers out there that are still kind of developing, and they're still at your your level mm -hmm. where you're where you're still very much finding yourself behind the wheel of one of these cars and, and figuring things out, is it better to race in shows where there's no guarantee you're going to make the field? Like I know some of these 305 events, you're racing against like 35 cars, and mm -hmm. 20 of them make the feature. I mean, would you sooner have it that way, or would you sooner personally? race at a track like Oshuiken where you know you're virtually guaranteed to make the A main. Do you want to have that safety net or would you sooner have to earn your spot in the show? Mm. Personally, I think own, or yeah, where you can, um, to see if you're good, not good enough, but like good to get up in like, to um. To fight your way in. Yeah, yeah, because. Do you find that you sort of, you get up on the wheel a little bit more when you know, like, okay, I gotta make it in here because there's, you know, yeah. there's only so many come out of the out of the heat races, and there are only four cars transferred out of the B. When you get that in your in your mindset, does it motivate you a little bit more than when you're out on weekend on a Friday night? And you know, you know, no matter what happens, if I spin out in this heat race, it's not a big deal because I know I'm in the A main no matter what. Does it yeah. does it change the way you approach the race? Yeah, it changes it a lot because I remember in the crates it was like, no matter where you ended up in your heat. It was basically just hot laps. No matter where you ended up in your heat, you'd made it you'd make it in the A. And like it was just going to Attica and like trying to fight my way in and like actually like go against the best three oh five drivers. It was it was great. Now you were down there with in Ohio, it was it a Millstream or Attica where there there were four other rookies and you were performing better than any of them. I think Attica Attica so I mean that has that has to be encouraging when you're when you're you're away from home you're going into this area that you're not familiar with and all of a sudden you're, you're picking up the track better than any of the other freshmen. I mean, is that a, is that a boost of confidence for you when when you realize okay I'm I'm starting to really get the hang of this place? Yeah, it's a it's a really big boost of confidence, but it it feels like um, you got like pressure on you too though because like you got to make like you want to do better than them and then like people kind of expect you to and it. It's kind of like pressure, but then it's like really big boost of confidence also. Do you enjoy the pressure? Because mm -hmm. that's just racing, right? I mean, that's, that's never going to go away no matter what. You, have you sort of, those butterflies that you used to get when you were first starting out, have you, have you learned to sort of use that as motivation now when, when, you're, when you're strapping into this car and getting ready for an A main? Mm, nope, I still get butterflies. <laughs> I'll always be scared. <laughs> or not scared, but like nervous and pressure and stuff like that. I'm sure one place you got a lot of butterflies with that Devil's Bowl. Devil's Bowl. I know the scene in Texas, it's crazy. And these yeah. ASCS races, man. Wayne Johnson, Johnny Herrera. Who, who else was out there? Tony T Bruce. T Tony Bruce, TBJ. I mean, there's a lot of man. just Sam Haverty, just stud, stud 360 <laughs> drivers. You're out there with the best of them. Mm -hmm. One particular heat race when you're starting. So they're all behind you. All the drivers that I just named up. And you're on yep. pole, correct? Yep. How did that work out? It I ended up winning the race, but like before that race, like I was shaking. I was doing, it, I was scared. <laughs> it was terrifying. I mean, that's like, you know, oh, a, a gunslinger rolling into somebody else's town, you know, and trying to take over the place. When you're when you're coming into the ASCS tour mm -hmm. with these dudes that have been doing it forever, you know, and they've sort of established themselves as as the premier 360 drivers in yeah. North America. To know that you have a package capable of not only running with them, but outrunning them. I mean, that, that has to mean the world to you. Yeah, that was probably my most, one of the most memorable moments of 2015. Cause like, 
I think it put my name out there also, but like it made I think it made drivers respect me too as a driver because they knew that I could handle it and did not to back down away from me just because I'm a girl and because I'm so young. But have you had any issues with drivers sort of shortchanging you a little bit and maybe thinking that you don't know how to handle yourself, or have mm. have they been for the most part respectful? Respectful, yeah. And <laughs> my first um, midget race. This one guy came up to me because I accidentally crashed him. Because it was my first race ever and I was... The Jason Leffler Memorial? Yep. Yep, okay. And um, I went into the first corner and I kind of kind of got pushed up, kind of not really. And then I ended up crashing this guy and he got mad and then came walking over to my car, hit me on the head, pushed me, and then a couple weeks after he found out I was a girl. <laughs> I, I got told he was like six to his stomach. <laughs> so... The, the, the midget endeavor sort of came, it kind of came out of nowhere, right? It was all developed out of that yeah. relationship with Parker Price Miller. Mm -hmm. So you've done the Jason Leffler Memorial. You've done the Chili Bowl. Uh, did you do the indoor event in, is it Decoin? Yep. Okay, so, so you've done some, some pretty big events with some pretty high-level competition. Is that something you want to continue pursuing? You want to you get back in the midget mm -hmm. for, for a couple more races? Kind of, but not really. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. Just midgets aren't really my style. Totally different from a yeah, uh, from a sprint car, right? So different. At least I think that, anyways. But but what's the atmosphere at the Chili Bowl like? Because there's a lot. I'm sure there's a lot of people watching this video that have never been that want to go. From a driver's perspective, when when you're when you're bolted and you're ready to sort of roll down that ramp to go to work, I mean, what, what's it what's it like? You know, in in Tulsa. It was, it was scary, but it was like really mm, really good experience to show people like what you could do and like how I was I was only my third race in a midget and that I ended up third in my heat against Casey Kane and this one guy who really really good too and I mean that's that's the kind of event where where any driver that's sort of on the come up mm -hmm. that's trying to develop a buzz like you are to go and run that event I mean everyone's going to hear your name they're going to want to know a little bit more about you it, it, it's the perfect marketing tool is it is that the race that Year after year, if you if you don't run another midget race during the regular season, is the Chili Bowl something you'd want to go back to year after year? Mm. Yeah, it would be. I I I know Sam Hayferty does does that only races a midget mm -hmm. one once a year, and it's at Chili Bowl, and he really enjoys it. And I actually really enjoyed the Chili Bowl, and I my second race after that big crash at the coin, I hated midgets. I said I didn't. I wasn't even sure I was going to do the Chili Bowl anymore. But then I decided to, and then I actually really had a lot of fun there. Is there anything you can learn racing a midget that you can sort of carry over to a sprint car, or are they just way too different? Mm, I, I think they're really different, and it didn't. Personally, I didn't think it really helped me with a sprint car or with a 360 sprint car wing, and I don't, yeah. Now, one event that I'm sure helped your ability behind the wheel of a 360 sprint car was the king of the 360s at, at East Bay. You just got home from it. I know it was, it was, a, it was a rough <laughs> trip. It was a rough trip. Yeah, okay, but still, seat time against elite level competition is always a good thing. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about how it went for you down at East Bay. And be honest. Mm -hmm. The Thursday night, I had motor trouble. The motor kept, I would press on the gas and then it would just, it almost felt like it was going to stall. So we changed, changed the motor that night, I think. And then I couldn't get back out for the heat. No, after the heat. I couldn't get back out for the B. No, I just made it out for the B, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. It was wild out there. I don't even remember. But <laughs> but I remember my motor was messed up, so then we changed it to a Fisher. And then after, I remember the night of that night we changed it. It was, um, we um, tried to start it, and then it ended up working after... It wouldn't work in the B, and then the Friday night I did. I think me and Daryl think I did really pretty good con considering what happened and stuff. And it was basically my first race there in a 360, and um, it was Friday night did went pretty good and I enjoyed it. And then Saturday night I went up for hot ups and total well not totaled the car but crashed it pretty bad. And but East Bay is a tough spot. East Bay is it's 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 a tough yeah. track to get a hold of. Track prep there is a little bit different than than most places. Yeah. It, it can be a little bit rough, and I mean you're you're racing against. 
I guess largely against ASCS national guys, right? That's that's yeah. the, the, pretty much what that event draws. So mm -hmm. a lot of the a lot of the teams you were racing against at East Bay, you'll be up against uh, in in this tour through Texas and Oklahoma. Am I right? That's that's coming um, up this weekend. I know Aaron Reitzel well, was one of them. Yep, Seth Bergman. And, I'm assuming yep. is going to be there as well. Yeah. Herrera. Yeah. A couple of those guys. I don't think he was. I don't think he was at 360. Was Herrera not at East Bay? No. Oh. He normally is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> Looking ahead to this year, going out on the road for 80 plus dates. Now, are, are they exclusively going to be in a 360, or do you have some 305 and some 410 stuff mixed in there? I know in April, I think it's April 8th, we're going to be in a 305 at Attica. And then and most, most of my racing is going to be in 360, but we're going to try to 410 at practice at Lernerville and see how that goes and see. We don't have anything scheduled for a 410 to race yet, but... But if you practice it and you get hooked... And I like it, then we're <laughs> probably going to be doing 410 races. No, but the 360 stuff you have scheduled, I mean, you're, you're not... It's not like you're dodging competition. I mean, you're, you're going out against the, the very best mm -hmm. of the best. Um, so you start... You start at... Is it Devil's Bowl and... Nope, Creek County. Creek actually. County. Yep. Creek County, thank you. So, and I mean, the, the scene in Oklahoma right now is is thriving like ascs national guys notwithstanding there are some super tough local guys regional guys that don't travel outside of oklahoma it's going to be a tough show it's going to be one of those races that's hard to to make the a main is it going to be one of those events where you're more motivated to to get up on the wheel yeah yeah i'm gonna try and like prove myself like how i did at devil's bowl and just try my hardest and try and do what i did at devil's bowl but we'll see what happens when you have an aggressive schedule like you have is it important to sort of get that strong start and kind of establish yourself early to give you that momentum heading into the summer? Yeah, I think I think it's important to get as many seat time as much seat time as you can and race whenever you can and and yeah. I mean, I was talking to Daryl off camera. He was saying pretty much the way we made this schedule was if there's a race, we're going. Yeah. So, I mean, what does what does that include like what's how many states are you hitting how, how many mm -hmm. how many times are you going to be in in texas and oklahoma because i know there's a there's a ton of ascs races down in that area of the country so mm -hmm. outside of this road trip that's just coming up this week and next how many more times will you visit that area of the country mm, oklahoma oklahoma i'm not sure but i know texas will be there a couple times we'll be there for two weeks in march and then i'm pretty sure we're going to be there late in the year again now, do you have a lot of races throughout the midwest Iowa. I think uh, we got some in Iowa, yeah. Do you have we some got, Knoxville? Yep, we're going to go there like once a month, a couple times a month. Really? Mm -hmm. So that would be National, is it National Sprint League? I'm not sure. I, like, I'm not sure. Okay. You don't know what the sanctioning is? No. But you just, just know that you're going to be... Just their weekly show. Just their weekly show. Okay. And then if you go and run the Nationals, it would be the 360 Nationals, I'm assuming, not the 410. Yep. Okay. I'm pretty sure we're running the 360 Nationals. Okay. Which, which in itself... It's Again, very much like yeah. East Bay. It, it's going to draw Stacked. the best of the best. Mm -hmm. And there's so many weekly guys in Iowa that if you, don't, if you don't go watch the weekly shows there, you probably haven't heard of them, but they're incredibly stout, yeah. right? Yeah, there's quite a bit of them. Because you go down there fairly often, right? You go there every year to watch the Nationals, mm -hmm. do you not? Yep, I do. So has that always been the plan? Like, you, you're sitting in those stands. You're watching that event. I mean, did you always know in the back of your head, I'm going to be here eventually? I'm going to make sure that my, that my dad... <laughs> puts the car in the box and drives to Iowa, I'm going to get here but, but sooner rather than later? Mm, probably a couple years ago, I never would have thought it. But probably the last two years, it's actually come, and I've thought about it and wanting to do it. It's a little bit scary because it's, it's a decent-sized track and wall all around it and all the stacked drivers that will be there. and. It'll be crazy. Now, what intimidates you more about Knoxville? Is it the facility itself or the level of competition you're racing with? Mm, kind of both. I don't really have a good um, connection with walls. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that connection. Yeah. You don't want to have a good connection with walls. Stay distanced with the walls. Yeah. So that, that's just one of the many, many, many big races you have coming up. I guess the, the, the flip side of the coin that Ontario race fans will probably be a little bit bummed out to hear is that you're not going to be at Ush Week in nearly as much as you have in the past. Mm -hmm. The plan is one race a month to get ready for the Canadian Sprint Car Nationals. Um, I'm assuming that it, it's going to be a little bit tough on you, given that you've you sort of developed a relationship with the people at Ush Week and you've certainly developed a relationship with the track. Yeah. You, you know it like the back of your hand by now. Mm -hmm. Is it going to be hard kind of going out on your own, going out on the road and, and shaking things up in, in that regard? 
I think it'll be weird not seeing the people that I see every every week on Friday night and not racing Australian anymore as much as I used to. And then it'll it'll be weird not racing it, but I think it's for the best to go and, oh, and travel and learn different tracks, meet new people, try different things. I mean, in your opinion, this schedule, taking you clear across the country, racing against, you know, the, the very best 360 guys, racing against 410 guys that are dropping down into a 360. I mean, just, just seeking out the best competition. Is this the best way to develop? Is this the best way for, for you to get better and for you to, to sort of hit that next level as a competitor? I think so, yeah. I think it's one of the main things that I need to do right now if I want to get bigger, bigger and better is race with, like, ASCS and whoever else that races out there. Go to Iowa, go to Nebraska. I'm supposed to race there once. At I-80? With some of the, I'm trying to think of the Nebraska. I-80 is like a pretty, so. it's in like McCool Junction. It's a pretty yep, famous place one. out there. Yep. yep. Okay, cool. So it's, it's enough. That's another really, really good weekly scene. So you're, I mean, hey, whoever's making your schedule, he yeah. clearly knows what he's doing. <laughs> Shout out to Daryl. He yeah. obviously knows. Shout out to Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's one event? I'll, I'll wrap this one up because you've been very gracious with your time. I know you're super busy. So what's one event, one event that you're super stoked about? I mean, if you could do one race all year. What would it be? Mm, pretty excited for Knoxville Nationals. Cause Good I've, choice. Because I've been there so many years. I've been there like past four or five years. And last year I went there and then I had to fly back to race Shwigan. So then I won't be able to, I won't have to do that anymore. I can just stay there the full two, three weeks there. And then this time I actually get the chance to race my car. And that'll be even more fun. Now, that's an event where your first time out there, your first time racing there, I guess just making the show is almost like a victory, right? Yeah, it will be, especially with all the stack cars that go there. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I can't wait to follow your progression. I know you have a really good social media team, so you'll be, you'll, you'll be keeping the fans up to date even if you're not racing in Ontario and they can sort yeah. of follow your progress. I know that all of this, let me pan over, all of this doesn't happen without a lot of support. Thank the folks that are uh, that are making your season happen for you in 2016. Mm, I can't thank my mom and my dad enough. They're my biggest supporters. And I can't thank Daryl enough. Cool chassis, John Cooley. He's he's great. Um, Ron Ron Montour, my other crew guy. He's he's great. He's awesome. Um, Townline Variety. That's the big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. No, not M1. Um, Bear Paw Convenience. Um, Davis Fuels, they're pretty good too. Um, creative Signs and Graph, or Creative Edge. Oh, yeah. They did a good job. Steve did a great job. I Car's looking badass. I love this car. I wasn't going to do another um, paint job this year, but I, after he gave my mom a couple designs, I was like, yeah, let's do it. So it's looking pretty good. Yeah. It's looking pretty sporty. Where can we find you on social media? Where can the fans start to stay up to date with you? Because they're gonna wanna, they're gonna wanna need, a, they're gonna need a way to ki to stay in touch with you when you're racing in Texas and Oklahoma. How how do they get the latest Alex Hill news? Mm, we have a Facebook page, Hills Racing Team, I think it is. Mm -hmm. And then I have my Twitter, which is Alex Hill 77 x Do you keep it updated? Yep. For sure. Yep. Follow her on Twitter. More, more so about Justin Bieber, but. <laughs> <laughs> but but more racing this year, right? Yeah. There you go, folks. So follow the, the Hills Racing Team on Facebook and at Alex Hill 77 x on Twitter. Alex, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for, for showing me the shop. Best of luck this year. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll call you next week. We'll, we'll check in with you uh, and, and see how Creek County went. Okay, thank all, you. All the best against the ASCS uh, National Drivers. Thank you.